Uh, just uh, what we're going to do this uh, talk on Highland Rescues and first a few words to introduce ourselves. Um, so I'm um, a certified rigger. Uh, I'm also, I was also an instructor in the last uh, reading workshop. And um, and and, yeah, and uh, last year, uh, sorry, distracting me by doing stuff with computers. And last year, I was um, I was working with uh, Radrig, so a cycling company based in the UK, uh, developing some gear. So just a few words to introduce myself. Hi everybody, I'm Stefan from Germany, slacklining now for over a decade. And when I started highlining, one of my first questions was always, what do you do in case of an uh, accident or somebody's injured in the line? How, how do you get this person off? And when I started highlining, there were not so many information around. And when I started to talk with people, there was not a clear guideline. And so I started diving, uh, diving deeper, deeper into this topic and it's really one of my passions, rescuing on high lines. <laughs> so, first of all, why do a rescue? <laughs> Obviously, to get the victim back on the on a safe spot at the cliff edge or at the ground, to get them some treatment for their injuries, as we hear, mainly fingers and hands which are broken or squeezed. And um, most important, to prevent more the further damage. Some of you have maybe already heard about the harness syndrome or the suspension trauma, which is uh, sitting or hanging for a long time in your climbing harness. And then the circulation of your legs gets cut off. And once you're back on the ground in a safe spot, all this blood is rushing back to your circulation and your circulation can collapse. There were some cases in climbing history where people got rescued, they were safe back on the ground, they collapsed, and then they died even before they got in the hospital to get proper treatment. So this is really a big concern, highlining, because obviously you hang below the high line, you sit there, you wait to get rescued in case you can't climb up again. This is, um, this is really important. And another case which never happened until now in Highland history is in case the person is unconscious. Um, we all know you hang then upside down in your climbing harness and your breathing can be blocked. And then you have like really little time, up to three, four minutes without breathing can be enough to have like big brain damages and you're disabled for the rest of your life. So quite serious topic. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in highlining, in highlining, so far there has been none of that happening. We're so far, quite lucky. Maybe, a, well, there has been some uh, for highlining rescues. There has been some death in highlining, unfortunately, from falls. Uh, but that's not uh, that's not what's concerning us here because it's already too late. But um, in highlining, most common injuries are, as Stefan was saying, to the fingers, to the hands, sometimes to the toes. Uh, shoulders as well a bit. Uh, so Philip sent me this number this morning. I haven't verified it, but it's like two out of three injuries are fingers, hands, or shoulders. And um, the most common rescues that we have to do are uh, just tired people on the line that are beginners that don't know how to climb the leash, and you just have to go there, pull them up, and then it's 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 all already over. Or from some uh, minor injuries as well. Um, so broken finger, yeah, you, you, like we have this picture uh, that was at the festival in Lebanon uh, where a guy just broke his finger and the rescue plan was just to go there, clip a rope to him and pull him back. It was like, it was just a short line, so only two tapes or, or so to go across um, with the leash, so don't even using a pulley. Um, on the uh, second accident incident report, there were very few rescues reported. Uh, in the last two years, less than five, uh, which is very low. I mean, we know that not every uh, incident is reported on the uh, is reported to the ISA by in this mean, but I know of definitely more than that uh, in terms of n number of rescues. But as I'm saying, as I was saying, just like very easy rescues, not big consequences.
Um, in the demographic survey, we have a bit more numbers. So there were 429 people answering this question. Um, and and of, out of those, 137 had to perform a rescue. So it doesn't, it, once again, it's only easy rescues, or mostly easy rescues. And uh, 80 were as a rescuer who went on the line, and 57 were there to assist from the anchor pulling on the rope. So uh, this is the graphic that's uh, in the bottom corner. Hmm? Um, there were no unconscious victims until now in the um, accident report, but I know yeah. of a couple who passed out. Yeah, I was, I was coming to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so there was no unconscious victim uh, for a long period of time. Like it was sometimes just a few seconds, but not nothing um, that we worry about for the uh, harness uh, or well, suspension trauma or the uh, breathing. Uh, so for suspension trauma, obviously, like if, if you've been sitting in a harness for a while, you know that like you can move your leg a bit and then you, you get it back. So that's something to maybe advise if you're doing a rescue for the victim. You tell them move your legs if you can, um, now and then. Um, there were also no rescues on big lines and no rescues after a back of fault. So no rescues on big lines. I think that's correlated to the fact that it's mostly beginners that have to be rescued. Um, even though now we see beginners on any kind of lines these days. Um, and no rescues are after a backup fall, uh, which are, we are quite lucky, uh, given that uh, if you have to go do a rescue after a backup fall, sometimes you're, or if you like it's an anchor failure and you're just on the backup of the anchor, then you have to go do a rescue on one rope that's maybe rubbing on some edges. Um, I don't want to have to do that. So do a safe rigging. But highlining in general is pretty safe. Uh, you're still muted. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> the next point is the basic exogen routine. We all heard about this when we did our driving license and um, it's quite boring, but um, quite important as well. First of all, identify the situation. What happened? Is the person just panicking? Is the person really injured? Can you maybe just uh, help her from the outside, calm the person down so that the person is able to climb back by her or himself to the, leash, uh, to the line and come out by himself? That would be the easiest and best way. If not, then um, you should prepare to do a rescue. And in case of your victim is really injured, first of all, call um, 112 or 911 depends where you are in the world. Mm, important for this is stay calm on the phone and uh, the person on the phone will always ask you the questions normally. What happened? Okay, you're highlining. Um, where are you? Depending where you are, you maybe should have ready your GPS coordinates if possible. And also really important for them is to know if you can perform a rescue or not. Um, so they know what kind of help you need if they need to send off people who can perform a rescue or if they just need people to get you back to the hospital. Um, in case you're somewhere really abandoned, there's a probability in Europe that they get you with a helicopter. Um, for this, you should keep in mind what you see on the right-hand side, um, the signalization to the pilot, yes, we need help, or no, it's not us, we don't need help, so that they can find uh, the spot fast and efficiently. And then, last of all, perform the rescue, stay calm, and probably send already one person off to the closest road to get help and or to a plateau, or a place where the helicopter can land. Um, no, quite basic, but quite important. Then to the rescue scenario itself, um, what do you need to do? First of all, you as a rescuer, stay safe, stay calm. You should, you will be in a rush because probably a friend of yours hurt and screaming and in pain. <laughs> so you have a big rush of adrenaline and you forget things, you move close to the edge, you're not clipped in. And this is the most uh, dangerous part of a rescue that the person who will perform the rescue is in a rush and is um, maybe not conscious of the danger that the person is putting himself. 
So um, the rescue itself, what do you need to do? Stabilize the victim, first of all. Put a chest harness to clip the person to the leash that the person is upright, not hanging <laughs> with the head down in case the person is unconscious. Second of all, you need to get the person out of the leash. Lift them up, then pull them back to the anchor um, and or to a spot where you can rappel down. And nowadays, as we have more and more uh, split setups, probably you need also to pass a connection, which is not an easy task to do when you didn't uh, try this before. There are multiple rescue methods. One of them is the counterweight system. It works very well in case you're heavier than your victim. Um, if not so, you can perform a rescue as a team where the people on the anchor help lifting the victim. And when you're alone and you cannot perform the counterweight uh, rescue, probably build up a little pulley system or get a pulley with your heaven hands to lift the victim out of the leash. Okay, so we're in, uh, oh, no, Stefan's still, I think. Still yeah, still me. Just uh, shortly, we don't want to go too much in depth in this because uh, the rescue material can variate a lot from where you are, what do you have in hand. Mm, just on the left hand side, you see the kit I normally bring to a Highline spot. It all fits in a climbing harness bag, so it's compact. Um, normally you should have the space and the energy to carry the up distant mountain. I bring uh, more or less 30 meter of rope, a little um, line slide, multiple carabiners, a few slings to attach um, to create uh, some anchor points to pull off from the side uh, and some jammers to pull on the rope efficiently. Um, on the bottom low part, the little picture with the two green carabiners was my first rescue kit. So it can be really basic. You don't need all of the stuff that you see on the left-hand side. I did rescues with it. It worked. It's more a hassle, but it does work. Um, on the right-hand side up, we see the kit we had at the THC last year um, at the festival to perform rescues there. Um, this should be more than enough to perform a good rescue. And then for big lines and or connections, there's this big pulleys. They do exist from Petzl, from all the big climbing companies to pass knots and connections. Until now, they're super expensive, but uh, we hope that there will be in the future some cheaper versions, which are, will be more accessible to us as the highliners. <laughs> and really important on the right hand side down, have two <laughs> have two personal anchors in case you need to pass the victim and or you need to perform um, you need to assist at the anchor point you need to go below the victim so it's nice to have a long personal anchor and a short personal anchor just to be flexible and not struggle with your own material you already struggle a lot um, with doing the rescue itself Okay, so we are not going to explain how to perform a rescue because of there is like lots of variations on how you have to perform a rescue. It's just that the things from the previous slide is the things that you need to practice if you practice rescues, and practicing rescues is the most important. Um, pr practice a lot. Uh, so here we have like some numbers from the demographic survey again. Um, out of 430 people that said the high line, uh, 198 have practiced rescues. Uh, so, considering the, like the people that answer the demographic survey are the most invested in, uh, well, they're, they're the closest to the ISA, the most invested in those questions of safety and all that, I would say that in reality, those are maybe the 198 people who actually have practiced rescues, plus Tom because he did not answer the survey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is, um, there were, so, um, and the uh, 101 have teach rescues. Once you know how to do rescue, like Stefan uh, knows very well, you don't practice it so much yourself. You're more like teaching people and then you're playing the victim for them to practice. 
but it's a good reminder of all the things that you can uh, encounter and especially um, you can learn a lot about what to do uh, with different people's gear because there's going to be times where you, you're at the high end with different gear uh, you can learn uh, what to do uh, when yeah if uh, like in, in difficult situations because you will see people struggle more and uh, you learn about these things um and uh yeah so the, the graphic here shows how many people have actually have actually bring a rescue kit and uh well it's only 28.5 percent of the people who answer so about 120 who have a rescue kit all, always um I imagine in those there are some that just like have a, a gooey a bit of rope uh, but that's perfectly enough if you, if you know how to do a rescue with that uh, in the rescue kit you should also uh, I should mention have a rope or tag use the tagline maybe if you, to pull the pe person across the line but you need something that's long enough to cover the length of the line you're rigging or the height you need to upsell um, and there's a lot of answers that are just sometimes. Um, I mean, that's right. There were typed in answers, so they're all different. Only for big highlands, that's a valid, that's sort of a valid point. Like in big highlands, you have a lot of gear, so you, it makes sense to have a uh, gear for the rescue, and sometimes it's also gear that you need for the rigging. Um, but uh, as we have seen, there has been very, very few rescues on big highlands. But that would be bad consequences if you need to, if, if somebody's on a big line and they need rescue, it can be very bad consequences just because of the time it takes to get the person off the line. Um, and uh, here are some pictures of uh, practices over the past few years. Um, so this was at a rigor cert uh, in Bern here. This was just a week ago. Uh, so you don't need to be high to practice a rescue. You don't need to be in a high line, especially if it's a first time practice. Uh, people are going to make mistakes. They're going to be unsafe. Just go one, two meters above the ground. Uh, you can go above water also. This is was at last year's Transalp Water and Tour, and you can obviously pr practice uh, on a real high line. At the rigor cert, uh, so Sarah was uh, talking about this in her presentation. Um, part of the uh, test is uh, to do to perform a rescue. Uh, the requirement is lift the first, lift the victim, tra uh, travel along the line. Uh, pass the connection, travel a little bit more, and then uh, lower them down. So we have a practice, and then we have a actual test. Um, here, a lot of people talk about hammocks uh, when they do rescues. They think, well, we can just put the person in the hammock. Um, that uh, put a person in the hammock and on the line is a good thing uh, for comfort. Uh, but if you need to get the person out of the line fast, and that can happen, for example, if somebody's bleeding. You don't want to just leave them uh, bleeding out in the hammock. Um, so this hammock was used in the rescue, but just as a um, comfortable chair. Uh, and the hammock is hanging on one um, pulley hangover, I think, just to pull across. In festivals, um, festivals is a good place to, well, it's, it's a place where you need to do lots of rescues because there's going to be lots of beginners. Um, it's a place to where you practice rescues. You have usually dedicated rescue kits on site. Um, so it's good that like a festival, when you get to a festival, if you don't know the kit, you need to practice. If you're part of the rigging team, you need to practice the, the, um, the, um, the rescue. But uh, in the demographic survey, so our, this graph is not very clear, I'm going to explain it. Um, there is 430 people that answered the, the uh, highliners, and out of those, I said 198 have practiced rescue, so this is the yellow and the green part. Um, and 157 have rigged at festivals, and this is the blue and the green part. But you see that, like, if you rig at a festival, you should have practiced, a, I mean, in my opinion, you should have practiced a rescue because it's a good place to practice a rescue. and uh, there's going to be potential for rescue, future potential for rescues. Um, but there are still some people that rigged at a festival without having practiced a rescue. So I would say that's this, this for um, festival uh, organizers to really have uh, in their planning, have a dedicated moment for 
rescue practice. So maybe you have one extra day if you between the end of the rigging and the beginning of the festival, which is only for practicing rescues. And you're usually late on rigging, so you can also use that for finishing the rig. Uh, and here are a lot of pictures of uh, rescue practice at festivals, but uh, it's a bit cheating because most of them were the same. Well, it's only three different festivals. So the all this top part is uh, in Turkey. Uh, this is uh, GGBY in the US, and this is in Mexico. And the common point with all of those pictures is that Sarah uh, <laughs> Gren <laughs> was uh, there and uh, organizing the thing. Um, I think we're done, unless Stefan wants to add something. Um, and we have uh, questions, and the pictures were by Sarah, who, as I said, like once you know how to do rescue, you're mostly being rescued, and Sarah has been the most rescued person ever. That we know of. <laughs> I don't really have a question, but it's super interesting seeing the service which you were showing. And um, I can only like say one little thing about uh, Austria, like Tyrol. Um, we organize always in our Slackline community um, rescue workshops. And it's super interesting because um, we get the support, financial support from the government. So we actually, we ask for a permission by the Sportunion. And then the Sport Union um, accepts it most of the times or something like this. And then we get the support from the government and even can, um, like, um, what? what means taking the question? Oh my God. And like, we can keep the costs very low because we get the support. And I think it's very important because a lot of people um, are using that chance to learn something and even I, I'm not the best in rescuing, I have to say, and it sometimes makes me thinking when I go on a, on a high line and when I see that nobody, I always ask if, if someone has a rescue set with them and then they say no and I'm like, okay, well, I think nothing might happen, but I'm always thinking about it. And I think I sometimes annoy even the people when I ask them if I have a rescue, if they have a rescue set with them. So it's also like this kind of like, fuck it kind of mentality sometimes and yeah but I left the word for others yeah that's one of the biggest problems I encounter also in France when I go highlighting there's never a rescue kit around never ever and this is always the first and biggest uh, problem you will have in case you have an accident when you don't have the material to perform it <laughs> Even when you could perform a rescue without the material, you can't. So always bring at least the minimum things you saw before. It doesn't need to be much, but bring it with you. Um, Peter, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I kind of retracted my, my hand, but it, it's, uh, I, I thought about like self-rescue and uh, whether you think that's important or whether there can be said more about that but then i also realized that uh as you said most rescue scenarios are with beginners uh and people that are experienced i mean probably they needed some kind of rescue but they just got themselves off the line somehow <laughs> and but like the the um to have like some kind of um mo in most situations you can probably get off the line somehow especially if you know some some tricks and maybe that would also be a good thing to teach, especially to beginners. Um, just a just a thought, not really a question or comment per se. Yeah, the self-rescue is something I tried myself as well, and it's a fun power to train when you're just highlining, just pretend you cannot use your dominant hand already. Makes climbing a leash way more complicated. It does work, and I guess it does also help you in a case of you have an injury. I myself injured last year my hand doing a rocket mount. It was not that bad, but um, yeah, definitely think also about self-rescue. Always take a line slide with you, even when you don't need it to walk the line. Um, in case you do injure yourself and you have it with you, you don't need to be rescued. Um, yeah. Big, but, big but, point. Um, we also have the three mentions of um, like like Philip said, I think there were two actual rescues that happened in the last year in, in the actual equipment. So we have five mentions of 
um, people who self-rescued and so, like who self did a self-rescue. So and rescue wasn't necessary. But if they wouldn't have had like the the necessary equipment or the strength or if they would have been injured just a little bit more critically, they wouldn't have been able to do that and then a rescue would have been necessary. Any more questions? <laughs> well, if no one has any more questions, um, we can start the next presentation, I would say, in, in five minutes. Um, there's one presentation which is not on the program um, officially, but Santi is here with us and he wants to give a talk about um, connections and highlighting, or split fractions and split setup. So, um, join us again. Thank you.